Hello everyone, welcome to the September 2021 in-service for the Kent Northwest Kidney Center, as I've said many times, the greatest dialysis unit ever. Today we will discuss how to evaluate and prepare a dialysis fistula for dialysis. This talk has four objectives. First, know how to examine a dialysis fistula. Second, recognize fistula pathology based on the physical examination. Three, be familiar with types of antiseptics used in dialysis units to sterilize the skin. And finally, appreciate the relative efficacy of common antiseptics. Let's begin with a review of the three types of dialysis access available. You all are very familiar with the three types of dialysis access used in this clinic, arteriovenous fistula, arteriovenous graft, and the dialysis catheter. Um, which access is placed in the patient depends on several factors, such as the urgency of dialysis, uh, the quality and size of veins in a patient's arms or legs, and the patient's overall health condition. Now, a dialysis fistula is the preferred method or gold standard for dialysis access just because dialysis fistulas last longer. They just maintain their patency a lot longer uh, than dialysis grafts. Uh, you may have heard of the campaign Fistula First, which emphasizes the importance of starting dialysis with a fistula rather than a catheter or a graft. The word fistula comes from the Latin word fistula, meaning tube or pipe. Uh, so a fistula is a connection between an artery and a vein. An artery have a lot of pressure in them. So when we measure the blood pressure in your arm, we are measuring the pressure in the artery. Uh, veins, on the other hand, are low-pressured blood vessels. So when you attach a high-pressured artery to a low-pressured vein, all of the pressure in the artery goes into the vein, and then the vein becomes bigger over the next two to three months to the point that it is large enough to insert a needle into it for dialysis. Um, there are three different types of dialysis fistulae. There's the radiocephalic, the brachiocephalic, and the brachiobasilic AV fistula. We'll talk about more of these uh, this later. Um, fistula typically takes at least 8 to 12 weeks in order to get big enough, uh, so-called maturation, increase in the size of the vein that allows for cannulation. Um, main complications of fistula uh, include stenosis or a narrowing of the blood vessel, uh, which can decrease the effectiveness of dialysis and also lead to clotting. So what is a stenosis? A stenosis is an abnormal narrowing of a blood vessel. Um, stenosis slows and reduces blood flow through the AV fistula, causing problems with the quality of the dialysis treatment, uh, can cause prolonged bleeding after a puncture, uh, can also cause pain in the fistula. Uh, stenosis can also lead to a blocked or clotted access. So that's why we really try to identify stenosis early, um, and we often uh, do that based on physical examination. The second preferred method of access is a dialysis graft. Um, generally uses a synthetic uh, biocompatible material such as polytetrafluoroethylene or PTFE. Um, can be made of cadaveric tissue uh, or um, say tissue like an artery from a cow, so bovine uh, carotid material is often used for a dialysis graft. Um, it's typically used in patients who have really small veins. So if the veins aren't big enough to support a dialysis fistula, the surgeon will consider a graft. Um, they're relatively permanent. Uh, lifespan is usually two to three years, but can last longer. Uh, the main advantage of a dialysis graft over a fistula is that uh, it can be safely used in about one to two weeks after placement. Uh, basically, you don't need any maturation of the blood vessel. You can go straight to 15 gauge needles if you want. Uh, the main problems, um, you can have some immunologic um, uh, challenges. Basically, the body can react uh, abnormally uh, due to foreign material. Uh, grafts clot more easily, and they're more likely to get infected than fistulas. The third and final choice uh, of hemodialysis access is a central venous catheter, or CVC. Uh, basically, it's a plastic tube uh, that has two lumens in it. Uh, basically, they can be placed in either the internal jugular vein uh, or the groin veins. 
um, allows us to draw blood from the systemic circulation filtered through the Dallas machine back into the venous circulation. Uh, main advantage is relatively easy to place, can be placed in virtually all patients in emergency situations. Um, main problem is that it's prone to clotting and infection. Okay, uh, let's move on to the second part of the talk, which concerns the physical evaluation of the dialysis access. Um, so physical examination must be carefully performed at the beginning of each dialysis procedure. It's the first step uh, in diagnosing an access problem. Uh, and we approach a physical examination of the access as we do any organ system of the body uh, using the following steps. Look, listen, and feel. So first, we visually inspect the access. Um, you can look at the size of the fistula. Greater than four millimeter diameter predicts 89% cannulation success. You look in the skin for redness uh, or erythema, which could represent an infection or a reaction to the tape or the sterilizing agent such as chlorhexidine or betadine. You can look for aneurysms, which are uh, a dilation of the wall of the blood vessel. Um, and also look for any evidence of thinning or ulceration of the skin, which could increase the risk of bleeding. Uh, if you ever see thin, shiny skin over an aneurysm, it's a sign of potential rupture. If you see swelling of the arm, think uh, outflow stenosis. So this could represent a problem with the drainage of blood from the arm, uh, as often seen uh, with a stenosis or narrowing of the dialysis fistula outflow vein. If you see a bunch of collateral veins, think a central stenosis. That is, uh, one of the veins in the chest is obstructed, making it harder for the blood and the fistula to drain from the arm. Look for evidence of peripheral stenosis or steel syndrome. Uh, this can be clinically manifest as a cold blue hand. It's frequently seen in elderly patients and patients with peripheral vascular disease. It's much more common with an upper arm fistula rather than a radiocephalic fistula. Note the surgical scar. So what can you tell from the surgical scar? Well, you can tell what kind of fistula it is. So if they have a wrist scar, that's a radiospallic fistula. If there's a scar in the elbow crease, that's an upper arm brachiopacillic AV fistula. And if they have a long scar extending from the uh, armpit to the elbow, that is a transposed bacillic AV fistula. Another way in which you can visually evaluate uh, the arm for a stenosis is by the arm elevation test. Simple test, you ask the patient to raise his or her access arm. Normally, when the arm is raised, gravity will uh, hasten the drainage of blood from the arm and the fistula should collapse. On the other hand, uh, if there is persistent distension of the fistula, uh, it suggests an outflow stenosis or a narrowing that prevents the fistula from uh, draining. So you can see when the arm was raised, uh, the fistula collapsed, and in this case, it reconstituted when the arm was lowered. The next part of the physical evaluation of the dialysis axis is auscultation or listening. This is done with a stethoscope. And the sound generated by a fistula or graft is called a bruit. Um, a bruit uh, can be described not only in terms of its pitch, but also the duration, you know, how long it lasts. Uh, is there a systolic and a diastolic component? Normally, a fistula should have a low-pitched, soft, uh, machinery-like rumbling sound. It's generally loudest at the arterial anastomosis. Notice that it is a continuous sound with both a systolic and a diastolic component. But if a stenosis is present, uh, the narrowing generates turbulence, resulting in a higher pitched brewing. And the third part of the physical examination includes palpation or feeling the graft. So 
<clears throat> the vibration that's palpable over a dialysis fistula is called a thrill. Uh, a thrill is a it's a palpable vibration uh, that's related to flow of blood through the blood vessel. And thrills are best evaluated actually using the palm of the hand rather than the fingers. So a normal uh, fistula is is soft and compressible, um, <clears throat> and the brewery is soft and continuous. Uh, that's palpable over the course of the fistula, and it's most prominent over the AV anastomosis where the scar is. Uh, and it should have both a, it should be a continuous vibration with both a systolic and a diastolic thrill. Um, <clears throat> when do you consider pathology? So basically you palpate the fistula uh, along its entire length up to the chest and pathology is suggested if the fistula is pulsatile, like a heartbeat, and if it's firm, or if the thrill is not continuous. That is, if you lose, say, the diastolic component of the thrill. So let's review the findings suggestive of a fistula stenosis. You might see swelling of the arm. The fistula may be pulsatile, firm. It may be dilated, uh, just distal to the anastomosis. You may lose the continuous thrill, particularly the diastolic component, so it's no longer continuous sound. And uh, the fistula may not collapse on an arm elevation test. So if you see any of these findings, think about a stenosis. All right, after you've examined the dialysis access, it's time to prepare for cannulation. And as you all know, this involves cleaning the access first with an antiseptic solution. So the word antiseptic comes from the Greek word anti meaning against and septicose meaning decay. Um, antimicrobial substances are applied to living tissue to reduce the possibility of infection or sepsis. Uh, disinfectants destroy microorganisms found outside the body or on non-living objects. Uh, some antiseptics are germicides, uh, capable of destroying microbes, we call these bactericidal. Others are what we call bacteriostatic that just uh, prevent or inhibit the growth of microorganisms. So here's some common examples uh, that uh, are available to us. Alcohol, uh, chlorhexidine, iodine, hydrogen peroxide, and uh, sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach. As you all may know by now, I love history of medicine. And so let's take a moment to review the history of antiseptics just for fun. Many of you have heard of Hippocrates as a Greek uh, physician and surgeon who lived uh, 460 to 377 BC. He was known as the father of medicine. Well, Hippocrates used vinegar to irrigate wounds, and then he wrapped dressings around the wounds to prevent further injury. Um, he washed ulcers with wine and dressed them with, what else, fig leaves. He was a man ahead of his time. In ancient Rome, Galen, a notable Roman surgeon, was the first to recognize that pus from wounds inflicted by the gladiators preceded wound healing. He actually thought that pus was a necessary step to wound healing, and he applied spice ointments to the wounds. So at least they smelled good. But unfortunately, in the Dark Ages, the advances achieved in wound care and surgery for healing wounds uh, by Hippocrates and Galen were lost after the fall of the Roman Empire. But then came the Middle Ages, when some men whose names are hard to pronounce, Hugh of Lucca, Theodoric of Servia, and Henry de Mondeville, opposed Galen's opinion that pus was important to healing. Instead, they advocated draining and cleaning a wound edges with wine, dressing the wound after suturing, and leaving the dressing on for 10 days while soaking it in warm wine. And of course, in retrospect, this is a good idea because alcohol has antiseptic properties. Despite the knowledge, however, that the application of alcohol could be used to sterilize and heal wounds, prior to the mid-19th century, limb amputation was associated with an alarming 50% post-operative mortality from sepsis. 
But then entered Joseph Lister, an English surgeon in London. And he followed Louis Pasteur's discovery that tissue decay was caused by microscopic organisms. And he theorized that the spread of these microbes through surgical wounds was responsible for the high postoperative death. In 1865, he began treating wounds with carbolic acid in an effort to prevent infectious complications. And then he discovered that the incidence of surgical sepsis fell dramatically. And that sort of catalyzed the adoption of modern antiseptic techniques that we use today. These include instrument sterilization, uh, the use of surgical scrub and rubber gloves, uh, and sterile uh, patient preparation as we do in the dialysis unit. In honor of uh, Lister's contributions, an antiseptic mouthwash, which was produced by Joseph Lawrence, who's a chemist in St. Louis, Missouri, was named after Lister in 1879. It contains alcohol, menthol, methyl salicylate, and thymol, and it was promoted by the slogan that it would kill germs that cause bad breath. In 1895, Listerine was uh, promoted to dentists for oral care. In 1914, it became the first over-the-counter mouthwash sold in the United States. In the 1920s, it was a runaway success when it was pitched as a solution for bad breath. Uh, in 1927, the company briefly marketed Listerine cigarettes. 1930s, 1950s, it was advertised that it would prevent dandruff if applied to the head. And finally, in the 1950s, 1980s, it was advertised that it would prevent colds which is uh, not true. Of course, we don't use Listerine in dialysis units. Instead, we have alcohol, iodine, chlorhexidine, and sodium hypochlorite or bleach. Alcohol solutions uh, typically contain either ethyl alcohol or 70% isopropyl alcohol. They are very effective antiseptic agents. Um, they're fast and short acting. Uh, they have broad spectrum antimicrobial activity and they're relatively inexpensive. Isopropyl alcohol is also known as rubbing alcohol, and it was popularized in North America in the mid-1920s. Um, originally, it was used as a liniment or lotion for massage, hence the name. But uh, there are some side effects of alcohol when used particularly as an antiseptic. First, uh, it is volatile and flammable. So there are actually reports of operating room fires uh, originally from alcohol-based skin preparation. Um, you can avoid that if you let the alcohol completely dry before you uh, operate. Um, <clears throat> and then poisoning can occur from ingestion, inhalation, absorption, uh, or consumption of the rubbing alcohol. So it should not be applied to mucous membranes. The next uh, antiseptic we'll discuss is povidone iodine. Uh, it's a broad spectrum antiseptic, uh, again, used for topical application to prevent infection. It's a chemical complex of povidone, hydrogen iodide, and elemental iodide, and it works by releasing iodine, which basically kills bacteria. Uh, povidone iodine was discovered in 1955 in Philadelphia. Uh, it's included on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, sold under a bunch of brand names, uh, including Bayodine. And more specific mechanism involves it, it iodinates lipids and oxidizes cell membranes of bacteria. Side effects of povidone iodine include a rash. So you can develop hives, itching, redness of the skin, stinging inflammation as demonstrated uh, in this picture right here. You can also absorb iodine. If you use a lot of it, you can absorb large amounts of iodine through the skin uh, and that can actually trigger an overactive thyroid or hyperthyroidism. The next antiseptic is uh, chlorhexidine, also known as chlorhexidine gluconate. Uh, it came into medical use in the 1950s. It also is included on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. It's available over the counter and it's marketed uh, in, under several brand names, Hippocleans, Chloroprep, uh, and Dynahex. Uh, chlorhexidine works by disrupting bacterial cell membranes. Um, it has more sustained antimicrobial activity uh, and more resistance to neutralizations by blood products than iodine or alcohol. 
um, and it can be used in a number of applications include hand washing, uh, showering prior to surgery, skin preparation prior to surgery, cleaning wounds, uh, preventing dental plaque, uh, treating yeast infections in the mouth. Uh, potential side effects include skin irritation, teeth discoloration when used as a mouthwash, uh, people can have allergic reactions, they can have eye problems if direct contact occurs. Uh, it is toxic to your ear if you place it into an ear canal with a ruptured eardrum. Um, now, some dialysis patients develop a rash over their fistula, and people always wonder, gosh, could they be allergic to the chlorhexidine that we're using? Um, so what do you do under the circumstances? Well, try applying chlorhexidine to the opposite arm. And if they don't develop a rash over the next 48 hours, they are not allergic to this medication. More often, the redness represents irritation uh, from frequent cleaning with soap and chlorhexidine and all that kind of stuff, rather than an actual allergy. So it's an irritation. Uh, and if you notify the nephrologist, he or she can just prescribe a topical steroid to manage this reaction. Okay, so I'd like to now spend some time comparing the relative efficacy of these antiseptic agents. So the first study that I'll review with you all is one that compared alcohol plus iodine versus iodine alone in cleaning a dialysis fistula. 68 dialysis patients were randomly assigned to either one of two groups of antiseptic, either iodine alone or iodine plus alcohol. And the outcome was inflammation, which is a surrogate for infection of the vascular access. What they found was that the combination of iodine and alcohol, so the use of two antiseptic agents, uh, was associated with less inflammation and infection than just the iodine alone. So in conclusion, uh, combination antiseptics appear to be more effective than just iodine alone in reducing infection over a fistula. This next study compared chlorhexidine uh, with iodine in surgical patients who are undergoing an upper abdominal surgery. 351 patients were randomized to one of two groups, uh, cleaning the skin with chlorhexidine or cleaning it with povidone iodine. What they found that the infection rate was 10.8% with the chlorhexidine group versus 17.9% in the povidone iodine group. So in conclusion, chlorhexidine appears to be a more effective sterilizing agent than iodine alone. This study compared the efficacy of iodine versus chlorhexidine plus alcohol in preventing catheter-related infections among hemodialysis patients. So the authors looked at exit site infections, tunnel tract infections, and bloodstream infections among two groups, those treated with povidone iodine alone, and those treated with a combination of chlorhexidine and alcohol. Among exit site infections, 10 patients uh, in the iodine group had exit site infections compared to only one in the chlorhexidine group. One person in the iodine group have a tunnel infection compared to none in the chlorhexidine group. And the risk of a bloodstream infection or bacteremia was six times greater among the iodine group compared to the chlorhexidine and alcohol group. So in summary, the combination of chlorhexidine and alcohol is vastly superior to povidone iodine in preventing infections among dialysis patients with catheters. Uh, this is another study that compares chlorhexidine versus iodine on rates of catheter infection when these two different antiseptics are used at the time of catheter insertion. So basically there were 56 patients who underwent dialysis catheter placement uh, and the catheter insertion site was cleated either with, was prepared either with chlorhexidine or betadine, and then they were followed for infection. And basically the incidence of uh, bacterial colonization local infection uh, was only 3% in the chlorhexidine group versus 21% in the betadine group. Again, adding support to the idea that chlorhexidine is a much better antiseptic and what we should be using in our dialysis unit. This is a study that compared chlorhexidine and iodine in reducing infection among patients who underwent central venous catheter plate. So not just dialysis catheter, but any sort of central catheter. Uh, and basically, they put in 538 catheters and they randomly assigned them to either getting clean with chlorhexidine alcohol 
versus povidone iodide with alcohol. Uh, and they found that those treated with chlorhexidine had 50% uh, decrease in the incidence of catheter colonization uh, with a trend towards lower rates of catheter-related bloodstream infection. So in summary, chlorhexine and alcohol should be considered as a replacement for povidone iodine, including the alcohol-based formulations. Uh, it's just much more effective in preventing catheter-related infections. The same has been shown uh, to be true for peritoneal dialysis catheter exit site care. Uh, this is a study done at Baptist Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where I actually did part of my uh, medical school. Uh, and they compared chlorhexine versus iodine on bacterial colony counts at the PD catheter exit site. What they found was that after 24 hours of exit site care with iodine, 54% of patients had coagulase and staph uh, growing at the site, compared to only 15% of those treated with chlorhexidine. So, you know, clearly chlorhexine is a way to go for not only hemodialysis care, but also peritoneal dialysis. Based on these and other studies, the CDC recommends the use of alcohol-based chlorhexidine solution as the first-line skin antiseptic for catheter exit site care. If for some reason they have a bad reaction to it and are truly allergic to it, you can use povidone iodine or isopropyl alcohol. Um, it's also data that I didn't go over that shows that the application of either povidone iodine ointment or uh, basically uh, an antibiotic ointment at the catheter exit site can reduce uh, the risk of infection. So in summary, there are three types of dialysis access, AV fistulas, AV grafts, and catheters. Of the three, AV fistulae last the longest and have the least potential for complications such as clotting or infection. Evaluation of the dialysis axis involves the following sequential steps. Look, listen, and feel. Remember the straight arm raise test. Uh, it's a good way to quickly look for proximal narrowing or stenosis. There are three antiseptics commonly used to sterilize the dialysis axis, alcohol, betadine, and chlorhexidine. Of the three, chlorhexidine is far more effective than betadine or alcohol in preventing infection. As a bonus uh, piece of information, remember not to touch the AV fistula after you have applied the antiseptic and before you insert the needles. Even if you're wearing gloves, they are not sterile gloves and you can contaminate the field again. So um, do all your feeling before you apply the antiseptic and then don't touch it with anything except for the needle. All right, it's time for your quiz. Da, 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 da. All right, easy question. What is the preferred source of hemodialysis access and why? That's right, AV fistula lasts longer, fewer complications such as infection or thrombosis. Next question, what are common complications of dialysis catheters? That's right, clotting and infection, very good. Next question, what do you look for on visual inspection of a dialysis fistula? Redness, aneurysm, swelling, scar, and collateral veins. Next question, name one physical examination test you can do to look for stenosis of the dialysis fistula. That's right, the arm elevation test. Name three antiseptics commonly used in dialysis units.
Excellent. Alcohol, betadine, and chlorhexidine. Last question. What should you not do after applying the antiseptic? That's right. Don't touch the vein because then you'll contaminate the sterile field that you've just cleaned. Okay, that uh, concludes the September in-service for the Kent Northwest Kidney Center. Again, I sure appreciate everything you all do. You guys are wonderful and make the Kent Northwest Kidney Center the greatest dialysis unit in the modern world. This is Andy Brokenbro signing out until next month.